Okay, so I'm going to start. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk today about a very, I think, a very interesting subject, a very interesting uh, case study. It's about exer exergy analysis of a biomass power plant integrated to a supercritical CO2 production system. Now that we already developed the concepts and the tools, the, the, the working equations to, to work with exergy, we can pour, perform such uh, this type of analysis, of uh, exergy analysis of a whole system. In this case, I'm going to start with this, uh, this idea, transforming a, a biomass power plant into a CCS machine, okay? And supercritical CO2, I'm going to explain what, the, what this is and why this is important, but uh, it's just a carrier, a vector for, for CO2, okay? And uh, I can also anticipate uh, it's a very um, interesting fluid for injection in a porous media, for instance, okay? So that's why uh, we can do this with a supercritical CO2, okay? Uh, before that, let me just show you the scenario. As I was mentioning, the idea is to transform uh, uh, several types of industrial units which would be emitting CO2 to the atmosphere to transform these units to uh, producers of supercritical CO2. So somehow the, the unit is adapted. We're going to analyze a, a biomass power plant, okay? How a biomass power plant can be changed, can can be retrofitted to a producer of supercritical CO2. And this supercritical CO2 somehow, by trucks for instance, and by pipeline, goes to a facility or an inverted uh, well, an injection well, and this facility injects supercritical CO2 into the underground, as it is shown here, okay? So uh, by doing this, we are actually pumping back CO2 to the underground. And uh, well, an observation, important observation, is that this technique is not new. Actually, it's, uh, it's been used since the 70s for, for enhanced oil recovery in the petroleum industry. So it's a very well-known technique, how to inject CO2 in this type of rocks, okay? Uh, well, this is the idea. It's already working, especially in, in the United States, because as I mentioned, it started uh, with this uh, enhanced oil recovery technique. Let me zoom here. I think it's interesting what, what this uh, means. Okay. Uh, so if you have a, a oil well, as it is shown here, and uh, Suppose this, this oil well is already uh, old, so the pressure here is not as high as it was in the beginning. So the idea is to inject CO2 in another well, which is perforated uh, apart, some, some kilometers or thousand meters apart, okay? And you can inject several types of fluids. And the idea is that this fluid somehow pushes the remaining oil to the well so you can uh, extend the useful life, okay, of this production well. As I mentioned, this technique is used uh, for, for decades in the United States and in other places in the world. And, well, if you do this with CO2 and if the, the layers, the rock layers are such that the CO2 remain trapped, okay, and they are uh, very um, interesting conditions for this. So you are actually um, fixing the CO2 on the underground. So you're pumping back CO2 to the underground and we can contribute to uh, recover our atmosphere's uh, initial composition, okay, in terms of, uh, especially in terms of the amounts of CO2, okay. As I mentioned, this is used in the United States and the idea, well, this is, uh, this picture here is from a very interesting report which is referenced down here okay and well the blue dots are uh, electric power plants for from uh, using gas or petrol or, or coal okay so those are producers of co2 producers like this and if these units these blue dots are transformed instead of emitting co2 to the atmosphere 
produce a, a supercritical CO2, you can take the CO2 to, to regions where the production wells are. So, okay, so these uh, black lines are CO2 pipelines, which already exist in the United States. So this is a reality in the United States. Okay, so you can, uh, the idea is to build new pipelines, the, those blue arrows or new proposed pipelines. And the idea is to transport supercritical CO2 to these regions, to the um, Gulf of Mexico and to, to Texas, okay, where you have uh, suitable suitable wells for this kind of uh, injection okay uh, so this is already happened in, in the United States uh, and also around the world okay so you have facilities in, in Canada and also in Europe and well in China and Australia and one in Africa uh, we don't have any of such uh, facility here in Brazil, but, but, it's very important, uh, we, we have those biomass power plants. And I already showed you that since we are using biomass, we are actually capturing CO2 or carbon atoms that were in, in the atmosphere. And if we send back that to the underground, so uh, the, the overall CO2 balance is negative. Okay, so we're pumping back CO2 to the underground. The idea today, I'm going to show you today, is to make the calculations and show you that this is possible to be done from a technical point of view. And from a technical point of view, I mean it is not necessary to import additional energy for this. Okay, The, the energy necessary for the process of producing uh, electricity and, and supercritical CO2 it's uh, the amount of energy that comes with biomass is uh, it's sufficient for this operation. You don't have to import. Okay, that means that you still have electricity uh, to sell to the grid. Okay, so you can uh, profit from this. We're going to make all these calculations, and uh, the idea is to show that it is, it is possible from a from an energy balance point of view. Okay, so. The, the whole point is how to transform, speaking more generically, how to transform a greenhouse gas emitting industrial unit to a producer of supercritical CO2 for geological storage. Okay, So depending on the particular process that you're talking about, you're going to have to make changes in the process. We're going to focus on a, a, a biomass power plant. So that's the idea. And we can start, uh, as always, by our sugar sugarcane uh, mills, which are also uh, also uh, power, uh, power plants, biomass power plants. So this is this diagram is a typical sugarcane industry. Okay, you get you have sugarcane coming here. You can produce sugar. Okay, ethanol. I included also a second generation ethanol unit in order to to sacrify uh, fibers. Okay from which you can produce, enhance, or increase the production of ethanol. And I also included some, some uh, processes to recover the energy content from Vinais. Okay, This is not important uh, today. What's important today is that we're going to uh, analyze this part of the power plant. The, the boiler, well, I have a, a picture here. We're going to focus on this part of the power plant here. Okay. Uh, and we already made the modifications to transform this to a supercritical to a CO2 producer. The idea, as I already mentioned, is to take some amount of energy and invest this energy. Uh, we're going to use this energy to produce supercritical CO2. Uh, as we are going to see in a few moments, this energy, this delta here, actually is uh, used for the most part in this process, oxygen separation, okay, for the oxy fuel boiler, and also to compress to compress CO2 to the state to the pressures uh, corresponding to supercritical CO2. Okay, so that's the idea. And as I mentioned, the whole point for this process to be feasible, to be from a technical point of view, this amount of uh, the remaining surplus is still positive. Okay. 
because uh, if it's negative, that means that you have to import energy from the grid, exergy to be more precise, okay? So you have to import exergy from the grid and this is not viable, okay? So uh, the idea is to show that you that this is possible, okay? So let's move on. We, we first, we start by analyzing the exergetic content of fuel, okay? Because, I'm going back one slide, uh, well, all the, the energy, if this is possible, if this surplus is still positive, that means that all the necessary energy is coming from biomass, okay? So we have, this is our main and only energy input to the process. Okay, so we first start by analyzing the energy uh, content and to be more precise, the, the exergy content of this biomass. Since I already explained uh, the concepts of chemical exergy, we can do this very easily. Okay, so let's start by analyzing fuel, okay, uh, and the whole process. So uh, the whole process, uh, as I mentioned, we are going to use some numbers some typical numbers from um, a typical sugar cane mill. Okay, so uh, let's suppose that we're feeding 150 tons of biomass, that's the fuel, and we have to calculate the amount of exergy that these 150 tons are carrying, okay, in terms of exergy. So we're feeding 150 tons per hour of biomass to, to, to the boiler, okay, this is actually an oxy fuel boiler, so we have to include an oxygen separation process, which is uh, represented down here. Okay, so this it, it also uses energy or exergy, okay, to to this the separation, and we're going to burn biomass with pure oxygen. Okay, so it burns, and another parameter that we're going to set, we're going to fix, is the combustion temperature. Uh, I think I already explained that uh, why we do this, because we have some effects. We, we, we want to prevent, first, formation of uh, nitrogen oxides, which are important pollutants, okay? And we also want to, to keep this uh, temperature low enough for the materials that we have to use, for instance, in the whole boiler or especially in the tubes here, uh, to be affordable, okay? Because if, you, if this temperature is too high, excessively high, we have to use special materials and this, um, this equipment is going to, to cost a lot. Okay, so it's an economical problem. Okay, so we burn with pure oxygen, virtually pure oxygen. Uh, okay, and we have hot gases here. Okay, I'm going to explain what we what we're going to do to control the temperature okay but uh, suppose we have hot gases here at 750 degrees okay so these hot gases will will uh, drive a thermodynamic cycle we're going to use a very simple Rankine cycle here because uh, i don't want to use an elaborate cycle for this case because the idea is to prove that the 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 surplus is still positive so if we can prove Prove this with a simple thermodynamic cycle, okay, so it's uh, the better. If, if we put here, as I'm going to, I think the last slide of this class is proposition of uh, more elaborate cycles. If we do this with a simple and uh, 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 low efficiency cycle, that's, that's okay for us, okay. So the heat from these gases is driving the thermodynamic power cycle, okay which produces exergy. So the, the, from the turbine we have exergy, which we inject in this, uh, this is a kind of a bus, okay, from, uh, from the electronics, like a bus in electronics, okay. So all, all exergy necessary for, for all processes we're going to take from this bus here, okay, this red arrow here. So the turbine injects exergy to the bus, okay, and then, for instance, uh, the, the exergy necessary for CO2 compressor compression we're taking from this same bus, okay, and also from the, um, the oxygen separation process. Okay, so this is the thermodynamic cycle, and 
after that we have uh, gases or cooler gases uh, at a temperature that we also want to control and we're fixing we're fixing 170 degrees why we do this for instance there are several reasons but to prevent uh, condensation of ashes here okay because if you, if the, this temperature is too low you can have ashes condensing over the tubes so you have falling and you have loss of efficiency thermal efficiency okay the the thermal resistance is increase and uh, you, you lose efficiency okay so you, we have to control this temperature and we're, how are we going to do this we can for instance measure this temperature and use this information to increase the the working fluids flow rate here okay so if this this temperature is too high okay too high 200 degrees for instance we can increase the pump here the speed of the pump so we send a uh, um, higher flow rate of water it's going to be water okay so water uh, by doing this we we increase the cooling effect of the working fluid from the Rankine cycle okay so if temperature is too high we increase the speed of the pump if the temperature is too low 150 for instance we can decrease the speed of the pump so we can use um, this scheme to control the temperature here okay and as I mentioned in the beginning this uh, numbers 150 tons per hour 750 degrees and 170 degrees here are uh, very typical numbers from the industry okay from uh, from the sugar mills that we have here in Brazil okay so uh, we have hot gases at seven uh, 170 degrees and if we are burning with pure oxygen we're gonna have okay we are gonna have co2 and water only we don't have nitrogen here okay well we have contaminants or and other non-condensables but they are negligible in terms of uh, the, the the energy balance that we're uh, performing here okay so uh, in this oxyfuel process supposedly we have a pure co2 and water here okay uh, steam actually okay uh, what we need to do next is to dewater the these gases this is easily done by cooling uh, further the, the process by doing this water condenses okay so water condenses here and one advantage of this is to recover water from the process because you know the the water balance in this process in in a sugar mill in a brazilian sugar mill is negative and from this we we can recover actually it's interesting because we we get more water than we we have here at the input okay because this biomass has uh, we're going to fix 40 percent of humidity so 40 percent is water from this 150 tons 40 percent is water and we're going to get more water because we have water that was injected here that was carried that that's carried by the fuel okay and we have also water that is formed during the combustion reaction okay because those are hydrocarbons and when those hydrocarbons uh, react with uh, oxygen they form water so we get more water at the exit here okay and another important point is that we can use liquid water this water is liquid we can recirculate this liquid water here in order to control the temperature okay so uh, the same way we did here to control the temperature of the the exit gases okay we can measure this temperature 750 the the actual process temperature and we can use this to open or close this valve in order to inject more or less water to the process in order to control the temperature okay so if the temperature is too high 800 degrees for instance we open a little bit this valve and we inject a little bit more water so it cools down the combustion process okay and the contrary if it's too low 700 degrees we close a little bit the, the valve here and by doing this we manage to control the temperature here okay 
but this water is always recirculating so what we get here is actually a surplus more than what is what was entering with the biomass here okay so we dewater those gases okay we dewater those gases we recover water and it's very important to recover water okay then we have what we have here is pure co2 at this point here we have pure co2 so we're going to need to compress this to supercritical co2 okay so um Again, we can use uh, more elaborate compressor schemes, okay? We, we're just using two compressors with two, actually one intercooler here, okay? Two compressors with one intercooler. And if we use more elaborate uh, compression process, we, we manage to reduce the amount of exergy necessary for the process, for the compression pro process, okay? And this exergy, I'm gonna repeat, it's coming from the, the exergy bus which is uh, fed by by the turbine okay so we have two compressors we have pure co2 here we compress to uh, an intermediary pressure okay then we cool down okay then we compress again we cool down and here if we have some non-condensables we can separate here for instance if this process uh, if we have 99 percent of oxygen and some amount of nitrogen Okay, some, some small amount of nitrogen, uh, we are not going to, nitrogen is still, is, is still a gas at 80 bar here. Okay, so we can get rid of nitrogen from, from, uh, from here. Okay, and we're going to fix the, the, the output pressure here at 80 bar. So we're going to spend energy or exergy to produce this pressure. Okay, because supposedly this is a defined by that company that is buying supercritical CO2, CO2 to inject in the underground okay so that's our problem for today we're going to analyze we're going to to analyze everything okay and we first yeah go on the what process yeah, it, yeah uh, the, sep the oxygen separation process you're talking about? Is that? Oh, de okay, dewatering, yeah, dewatering process. Uh, it actually, you have to cool, you remove heat, okay? So it's represented here. And this heat here, which we are injecting, I don't know if you managed to see, we, we, ha we also have... Uh, a heat bus here okay this is it's the green arrow so for instance we remove heat from from the cooling tower and we inject in this bus we can use this heat uh, in uh, for heating water for instance in a sugar mill uh, so we don't need to to use exergy for this process but uh, this heat contains exergy, so we have to calculate the exergy content of all these uh, cooling processes here, and we're going to do this. Okay, so we don't have uh, an electric motor, for instance, as we have here for these compressors. So we don't need exergy, we don't need uh, electricity to cool these processes down. Okay, but uh, this uh, heat contains exergy and we are going to assess this in order to make an, the overall balance okay okay, okay. Uh, the, the two uh, most important processes in terms of uh, exergy consumption is compressor com the compressors here and the separation oxygen separation process which I'm not detailing but it's also a compressor okay I'm go we're going to focus on if each of these processes, so no problem. But we start first before entering in this uh, in, in this uh, process. We're going to analyze um, the fuel. Okay, so just for for simplicity, I'm going to um, say that uh, our fuel is some molecule, some generic molecule. Okay. A certain number of carbon, a certain number of hydrogen, a certain number of oxygen atoms. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to take this one because it's uh, the most uh, similar to to fiber. Okay, just to simplify a little bit the, the equations. I didn't want to use, uh, for instance, methane. The first time I presented this calculation, I used methane here, uh, but we don't have oxygen in methane. Okay, so I just wanted to use this compound to simulate uh, our biomass. You you can have actually you can you have information in the literature. Uh, corresponding to to sugarcane bagasse or straw and so on. Okay, just to simplify things, I'm using this molecule. So the idea is uh, to well, we're setting another number here. Is uh, this 150 tons per hour of biomass contains 40 percent of humidity? Okay, this uh, is you know sugarcane bagasse when you put that into the boiler to burn. It typically contains 50% in terms of humidity. Okay, uh, if you mix some straw with sugarcane bagasse, since straw is very dry, the humidity drops to something around 40%. So this number, 40%, and this particular molecule, I, for, I forgot the name of this compound. Okay, so 40% in this molecule is uh, representing in this case study actually a, mix, a mixture of uh, sugarcane bagasse mixed with some amount of straw okay to, in order to have this kind of humidity okay so it's uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not it's it's not unrealistic so it's very uh, commonly this kind of situation is very common in actual applications okay so you can as i was mentioned you you have information concerning the chemical exergy of several types of fuels uh, I just put two papers here for if you're interested in this type of, of um, information, if you're studying this, okay? And yeah, this is the molecule I was talking about. And the kind of information that you need to, to, to assess the, the exergy content is, well, you, you, you can have uh, uh, the formation exergy as we have here for this molecule, okay? But you can also, if you don't have this, you have if you have enthalpy of formation, uh, Gibbs energy, and so on. I, I showed you in the chemical exergy class how you can calculate the, the exergy content from uh, other types of data. Okay. Well, in this case, we already have the, the specific exergy content of our fuel. Okay. And these papers here uh, give you. Uh, several uh, information such as this one for several types of biomass okay you can uh, you can uh, use this type of inf information okay so what what are the calculations that we're doing we have this number that's the exergy content of, of this molecule 2193 kilojoules per mole okay so this is this number here okay we multiply this by well, actually, I'm multiplying by the, the uh, molar mass of the molecule, which is given here, actually. Okay, and we have the the, the exergy content in terms of uh, kilograms, so 17.958 megajoules per kilogram. Okay, we're going to be doing this a lot. There are some sometimes it's easier to work in terms of uh, molar concentrations. Sometimes it's easier to to work in terms of uh, per kilogram, okay? So we're gonna be doing several times this type of conversion, okay? So when we, this is the exergy content in terms of kilograms. When we multi multiply this by the, the mass flow rate of fuel, which is 150 kilograms, sorry, tons per hour, okay, times 60%, because 40% is water, okay? So these calculations give this number, 448.9 megawatts, okay? You can, I'm going back one slide, you or two, okay? So you, you already can think in terms of the, the electricity, okay? Just to, to use uh, another word in, in the place of exergy, that's the amount of electricity that is being injected, that is being carried uh, by, by biomass, okay, by injecting biomass, okay. So that's the, the result 
almost 500 megawatts. Okay. Well, so we have already the input. Now let's uh, do other types of calculations. For instance, if 40% is water, what is the amount of exergy carried by this water? Because it's liquid water. Okay, it's not water corresponding to uh, to the natural state of water in the atmosphere. So it also have it has a, a certain amount of exergy. You that's the the exergy content of water. You get this from well, you can ha have this kind of information from from uh, I think this is the the book from from Singel, Okay, thermodynamics. At the end, you have the the exergy content of water liquid water actually liquid water it's 45 uh, kilojoules no sorry kilojoules per mole okay per kilomole actually kilomole so we're making the calculations to assess the water content the, the exergy content of this 40 percent of 150 okay so converting to mass we have actually 2.49 kilojoules per kilogram multiplying this number by 150 times 40 percent we have 41.62 kilowatts which is uh, actually negligible in terms of this number here okay but we still have this number there. okay okay so we already have one result uh, it's this calculations here we're going to be coming back several times to this slide each time each each time we, we uh, get a result in terms of exergy and mass flow rates and so on, we come back, back to these slides and we, we write down the result. So we just calculated the amounts of uh, uh, fuel, C4H10O4, okay? So we have 90 tons per hour of fuel and the corresponding exergy content is 448 megawatts, okay? Uh, the remaining 60 tons of water per hour contains only 41.6 kilowatts okay so this is already a result okay and what we're going to do now is to make a thermodynamic analysis a several actually several thermodynamic analysis okay and uh, one actually the the last one is going to be this one that i'm highlighting here so you see this dotted line is the control volume so it uh, encompasses all the process so the uh, what we need to do is to calculate how much water do we get here so, okay and uh, what is the exergy content of this water okay how much heat is being removed here at the intercooler and how much heat and how much exergy this heat contains Okay, so that's what, what we have to do next. So this control volume that I'm showing you right now is the last one, the one that we're going to, to use to make the, the, the overall exergy balance, okay? Uh, in order for us to, to calculate the amount of exergy that is being destroyed in the process, okay? And also we're going to do, okay, if, well, I forgot to mention, we're going to, to assess all the exergy inputs and outputs and heat inputs and outputs and mass inputs and outputs okay that's what we're going to do and then we're going to uh, well uh, impose mass and energy balance but the point the, the final objective here is to uh, apply this formula which is sorry for the portuguese okay so this is exergy balance a kind of a sunkey diagram of the overall process Okay, so we're going to apply this equation that I already showed you. Okay, this is the exergy balance. All exergy associated with heat flows. Okay, remember, um, the exergy content of a heat flow is uh, corresponds to uh, the work produced by a virtual rank, uh, sorry, Carnot cycle. Okay, uh, being... Uh, driven from this heat okay by this heat i mean so you multiply by a kernel efficiency okay so you, you can also have work input and output and uh, exergy associated with mass flows okay since the process supposedly is at uh, 
permanent regime. What we're going to calculate is this term here, okay? The amount of exergy that is being destroyed in the process in order to assess the overall exergy efficiency of the process, okay? So this is the objective. This is our, okay, the magnetic north, actually. And to do this, we have to analyze in detail several processes. So we're going to proceed now to a thermodynamic analysis in details, okay? And this also corresponds to different control volumes. So for instance, we're going to define a control volume here and analyze the combustion process, okay? We're going to define another control volume and we're going to analyze the separation process in terms of exergy, okay? And well, here too, in terms of uh, how how much water do I have to recirculate in order to control the combustion temperature to uh, 750 degrees, okay? So all these dotted lines represent the control volumes that we're going to use in the following slides in order to calculate uh, the amounts of heat and the corresponding exergy contents, heat, and, and so on, okay? So we're going, we're coming back to this slide several times, okay? And we're going to start by analyzing the, the biomass combustion process, okay? And this is important because we don't know, we, we have to, to define or to calculate the amount of oxygen that we need to recirculate, okay, to, to inject. Uh, and this is defined by the amount of, of uh, fuel that is being injected here. We also need to calculate the amount of water to control the temperature to, at uh, 750 degrees, so that's why we have to perform a combustion analysis here, okay? So we're going to start right here at the furnace, okay? At the burner, okay? Well, I prepared uh, some equations for a generic fuel, as I was mentioning, okay? So our fuel, a generic fuel, can be modeled so, like this, C-A-H-B-O-C, so this may represent uh, from methane, okay, to, to gasoline, for instance, to lignin, to whatever, okay. So this is the, the most generic uh, combustion equation that you can have, okay, a certain amount of fuel, okay, N fuel is the number of moles of fuel, and NO2 is the number of moles of oxygen, and as I was mentioning, if you have some residual nitrogen you, you can also account for this, okay? So, you get the idea. And this uh, in water is actually the amount of water that is being recirculated here. You see, you have this water is liquid. On the other side of the equation, at 750 degrees, you have gas in the gaseous state, okay? So, you, you have this in what is the number of moles of water that was uh, vaporized and you also have some amount of water that is being formed during the combustion process, okay? Uh, okay, that's it. Let me see if I have some, yeah, some, some um, hypothesis. There are no losses of heat to the environment, so this is very well insulated, so we don't have to worry with heat losses here, okay? Just to assess the inputs of outputs in terms of mass flow rates, okay? So uh, the chemical reaction, the combustion reaction, actually occurs, okay, it starts, all the, the, the reagents enters at 25 degrees, okay, and they end up at a certain uh, combustion temperature. We already know it's 750, but as I mentioned, I want to, to develop some generic equations, working equations, okay. Uh, for instance, if you use... Uh, if you are interested in terms of using biogas, you, you can adapt this equation, these equations to biogas, okay, very easily. So, um, something we have to, to be to concerned, to take care, actually, is to assess all the enthalpies. We're going to apply the first law of thermodynamics here. So, the, the problem is to assess the enthalpies at the proper uh, temperature. So, that's why I'm highlighting the fact that the, the, the reagents are at uh, different temperatures compared with the products, okay? 
Oh, yeah, another hypothesis is that the reaction is supposed to be complete. Okay, because if the reaction is not complete, you can have, for instance, the formation of, in addition to CO2, you can have uh, CO and also C, okay, if the, the reaction is not complete. But in this case, we're going to suppose this. It's a, actually, because we, uh, in practice, we used to, we tend to use excess air, not only to control the temperature, but, but also to assure that the, the reaction is going to be complete, okay? Okay, so let me show you first the reaction stoichiometry, okay? Uh, by applying this, this uh, by counting, by, by accounting the, the number of atoms for each species on the left and on the right side of the equations, you get these numbers, okay? So uh, the amount of CO2 that you get is, well, if you have, if, if N few is one, okay, if, is one, you have a small a uh, atoms of carbon on the left side of the equation, so you have to have the same on the right side. So NCO2 here, this variable here, is equal to a. Okay, you, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with this, so you get these results uh, in terms of uh, this this uh, number of moles here okay number of co2 h2o and o2 okay uh, yeah and what we need to do now is to apply the first law of thermodynamics to this process to this chemical equation here okay and since there are no heat losses and no production of work okay so this term here in this one is zero and we get the sum of the enthalpies of all products minus the sum of the enthalpies of all the, the reagents is zero, okay? Or the sum of the enthalpies on the left side is equal to the sum of the enthalpies on the right side, okay? Okay, uh, well, um, I have just to explain something for, for those of you that are not, not watching through YouTube behind my video, you have a, I have a symbol here, which means that I'm going to jump a few slides, okay? I'm going to explain the following slide. I'm not jumping. The following slides, I'm explaining the concept of, of uh, Hess law and so on, other chemical calculations. I don't need to do this here for you. Uh, first, because you're already, you're all already familiar with this type of analysis, and also because I already explained this in other classes, okay? So I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna jump a few slides in order to uh, to apply this equation, okay? Okay, so we're jumping, we're, we're making this particular calculations for the molecule that we have, C4H10O4, and we're going to consider 0% of humidity, just for simplicity, okay? So uh, the slides that uh, were back that I did not not show you, contain very, very detailed explanation about what I'm going to do now. But I, I think it's very, very easy for you to follow the following slides, okay? So, uh, we're going to do the analysis for this uh, non-generic equation, combustion equation, okay? So, one mole of C4H10O4, okay? And to burn this, we, we're going to need 4.5 moles of O2. This the number of moles of water, I don't know. Right now, I don't know because I want to calculate this in order to have a combustion temperature equal to 750 degrees. So it's a, an unknown of the, the equation, okay? So I'm going to calculate this actually by applying first law of thermodynamics, okay? So 4.5 moles of O2, a certain number of moles of H2O, which we're going to calculate, uh, we have four moles of CO2 and uh, five moles of H2O formed uh, through the, the combustion reaction, okay? And the same amount of moles that we injected here, we have here, okay? Okay, okay. So uh, when we apply the first law of thermodynamics, we have here, we have one mole of fuel, that's the enthalpy of fuel, plus 4.5 moles of enthalpy of O2, okay, 
and I'm emphasizing the temperatures, okay, at the left hand side of the equation is at 55 degrees, okay, uh, 25 degrees, sorry. So uh, entropy of the fuel is 25 degree, at 25 degrees, entropy of oxygen at 25 degrees, then uh, a certain amount of moles of H2O, liquid H2O at 25, okay? On the right-hand side, four moles of CO2 at the combustion temperature, okay? We already know it's 750, but we're going to analyze, uh, we're actually going to make a, a graph, okay, uh, to, to define the amount of water that I need to recirculate for a given combustion temperature. Okay, so four moles of CO2, five moles of H2O multiplied by enthalpy of um, H2O and the unknown amount of moles of recirculated H2O, okay? Uh, it, it's going to become clear in a few moments why I'm separating five plus N in two terms here, okay? Actually, I can tell you already because this, this uh, term here contains... Uh, latent heat I'm going to show you okay because it's being evaporated water enters at liquid state here and it's all at, at uh, superheated steam okay so the problem now is to assess this entropies okay and uh, a particular problem that we have is that let me write this down okay because you see uh, these entropies here may be uh, may have different references okay i'm going to i think i can show you uh, in ref prop i'm going to i'm going out of the presentation and i'm going to show you ref prop you know uh yeah let, let's just uh, show you where we have this depending on the substance okay depending on the substance you have different reference states so you see you have reference state uh, there are several default reference states. You also can set your own reference state. And the problem is that different, uh, if you don't take this, if you're not um, uh, aware of this, you can mix different entropies calculated at different reference states. Okay? Uh, there are two ways to, to avoid this problem. Okay? The first one, you uh, go to, to, for instance, if you're using RefProp, you go to the reference uh, uh, menu and you, all the time, every time you change a substance, a fuel to O2 to water, you make sure that uh, the reference is the same. Okay, this is one solution for this problem. Okay, another solution which I'm going to show you here, it's the most common one, is to calculate the enthalpy of a, a given substance, okay, so the enthalpy is going to be calculated in this way. So you, you have a formation enthalpy, okay, so you're going to suppose that your product, your compound is being formed, so it uh, takes a certain amount of enthalpy to be formed, okay, and uh, it, it's always at 55 degrees, okay. Uh, and if you have, if this enthalpy is to be calculated at a certain temperature T, okay, then you add, okay, uh, energy, heat, actually, to heat from 25 to T. So you have delta H here, okay. And this delta H actually contains two, may contain two terms, uh, a term which corresponds to sensible heat, sensible sensible okay and if, uh, if it involves evaporating water as we have here this water is being evaporated here you can also have some amount of latent heat okay so that's what we're going to do for each of these uh, of these compounds here if you do this you avoid the problem of calculating different enthalpies or Entropies of different species uh, with different references. And if you do this, all your calculations are, are wrong. Okay? So in order to avoid this, we're going to apply this method. 
Okay, so let's see how it works for a few. Okay, so you have formation enthalpy here. Okay, then the energy necessary to change its temperature from 25, which corresponds to the formation enthalpy, okay, to the same 25 degrees. Okay, that's a, a coincidence because we fix the products at 25 degrees. So this uh, is zero actually because you don't need energy. You don't need heat to change the temperature from 25 to 25. Okay, and you get you have only this amount here, which is the formation enthalpy of Q. And this number here, okay, this number. I'm going back some slides. Let me jump back there. Yeah, uh, where is it? That number is here. Formation, yeah, oops, sorry. The number is here. Let me show you, okay? Sorry, the number is here, okay? So this is uh, data that you have, that you can use. Let me go back to where I was. Let me find my jump point here. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, the enthalpy for fuel. Now, now let's see enthalpy for oxygen. Okay, so it's the same. That's the we have formation enthalpy. This small zero here represents formation enthalpy. Okay, plus sensible enthalpy. Okay, but it's zero because the compound is at already at the same temperature at the same formation temperature the standard formation entropy okay and this is zero for o2 as you know okay and for liquid water for liquid water okay formation enthalpy for liquid water plus the sensible enthalpy which is zero because the temperature is the same as the formation temperature Okay, so this is the formation enthalpy for water, for liquid water. Okay, now let's see the other side. It's more, more complex, a little bit more complex, because we don't cancel these terms here. Okay, so let's see, for CO2. For CO2, we have, it's always like this, the formation enthalpy plus delta H. Okay, and in this case, uh, formation takes place at 25 degrees, but... The compound, the CO2, is at the combustion temperature. So we have to assess this. This is not zero because this temperature, okay, is different from, from 25 degrees. Okay, so minus 393 is the formation enthalpy of CO2 at 25 degrees. And this delta H, I'm calculating... Um, um, uh, well, there are several ways to do this. I'm using this one. I'm, I'm using the CP, which varies with temperature, but I have this uh, law to assess how CP varies with temperature. Okay, CP of CO2, okay, multiplied by delta T. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you uh, managed to, to see this. Delta H, okay, is CP times delta T. Okay, that's the the formula that I'm using, Cp, okay? Okay, so that's for that's for CO2. And when you put all the... Uh, and remember, I'm leaving this temperature as an unknown because I, we're going to vary this, okay? So when we replace how Cp varies with temperature and we put in this formula, you have this final result for the enthalpy of CO2. Okay, uh, for the water that is formed during the combustion reaction, okay, so we have formation enthalpy and then uh, the delta H. It's only sensible enthalpy because uh, this is the formation enthalpy of uh, vapor, okay, of vapor, water vapor, okay, so 241. Minus 241.8 is the formation enthalpy uh, of water vapor. So it's already uh, at the vapor state. So you don't need to, to evaporate anything. So you only need uh, the, the sensible enthalpy from 25 to the combustion temperature, 
which were using the same method, for which we're using the same method, the CP times delta T. And CP of water, you, um, I'm using this formula. Do you know how, how to obtain this kind of uh, formulas? Do you want me to show you how to obtain this kind of formulas here? Okay, it's very easy. I'm going to show you because I already have uh, RefProp open here. You do this. Well, we already have water here. What you do, you calculate, yeah, you have to plot CP. So properties, uh, let's make sure that CP is being calculated. So uh, I can, um, for instance, fix the temperature at 200 degrees, one bar, uh, 300 degrees, one bar. Uh, 400 degrees one bar and so on okay 500 one bar then I have this this is the CP in, in function of the temperature at this pressure okay so what I do I, I get this I control C okay control V in Excel for instance then I fit a linear curve okay a straight line to this a straight line works fine for this for this result okay so it's very easy to uh, to get this kind of formula here for variation of CP by doing this you avoid having to use uh, some special library for calculating these properties okay the alternative to this is calculate uh, directly the entropy okay and yeah I have one example in which I'm doing this uh, I have a spreadsheet that I can uh, uh, publish the link for you to download it, okay? Okay, so this is water that was formed during combustion, okay? And I was explaining that for this case, we don't need to add a latent heat because this water is already formed, is formed actually in, as vapor, not as a liquid, okay? The other term here is actually water that is was evaporated during during the process okay so it contains formation enthalpy latent heat because it starts at liquid and it ends at, as a vapor so latent heat okay and then sensible heat to uh, change the temperature from 25 to uh, to the combustion temperature okay so uh, this number here, 40.6686, is corresponds to the latent heat of water at one bar. Okay, because water here, water and fuel is at uh, or at one bar. Okay, the only gas on the left hand side of the equation is oxygen. Okay, here you have solid and here you have a liquid. Okay, so that's why I'm calculating it at one bar. Okay, so I have uh, all the enthalpies for all the compounds, both on the left and on the right side of the equation. And I now can uh, apply the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so here it is, 1 times, that's the, the enthalpy of U, okay, uh, N times the enthalpy of uh, water, liquid water, on the left-hand side, okay equals to 4 moles, okay, 4 moles of, that's the enthalpy of CO2 uh, at a generic temperature, okay, that's uh, enthalpy of CO2. Now, I can, I have this other number, 5 plus N, that's the enthalpy of, of uh, water vapor, okay, plus the latent heat, okay. So you see in this formula here, you have two unknowns. You have the number of moles of water that you have to recirculate in order to uh, make the temperature equal to a given number. Okay. So we can, from this formula, we can isolate uh, this variable here, N, okay, in function of the combustion temperature. Okay. So we now, in if if I'm not wrong, because well these numbers are not very easy to deal with, uh, well this is the correct result. Okay, it is correct. Okay, I'm I'm just joking. Uh, so we can plot now a graph of n 
in function of the combustion temperature. And that's what we're doing right here, okay? So we have here the combustion temperature. Suppose that you're, a de you're designing the process. You're not sure uh, of the temperature, okay? So uh, you can vary the combustion temperature in that formula on the last slide, this one, okay? Uh, by applying this formula, you can calculate the amount of moles of water that you have to recirculate in order to have that specific temperature, okay? For uh, 705 degrees, 750 degrees, okay, 750, the result is 5.266 moles of water, moles of liquid water per mole of fuel, okay? This is per one mole of fuel, okay? Uh, and since it's easier when we were compiling these results, uh, we are dealing with, uh, not in terms of moles, but in terms of kilograms, we multiply by the corresponding uh, molar masses, and we get this result. So 5.266 moles per mole correspond to 0 0.777 kilograms of H2O per kilogram of fuel. Okay, so this is our, um, our result, actually. We have some results here. We have we have this result. We have uh, also this result, which is the amount of water that is formed. Okay, and we're going to compile this. Okay, so just to to show you all the results where where these numbers apply. Okay, so we have uh, we have one kilogram. Suppose we have one kilogram of fuel. Okay. Uh, to control the temperature at 750 degrees, we need 0 0.777 kilograms of water, okay? We're going to need, for each kilogram of fuel, 1.18 kilograms of uh, O2, okay? Which correspond to 5.07 kilograms of air, okay? The remaining, uh, the, the difference is, correspond to, to nitrogen, okay? The combustion will form... 1.51 kilograms of of water, okay, and 1.44 kilograms of CO2, okay, and that's the composition in terms of mass. We're going to need this in order to to calculate the thermodynamic properties of this combustion gas here, okay. Okay, so uh, you see, ah, yeah, another uh, important thing is that. Uh, when you see this result, I, I was mentioning that you get more water uh, uh, formed during the process, okay? We have, in terms of moles, we have uh, 5.266, which is this number, and uh, after the combustion reaction, we have 10.266 moles of water, okay? So we get more water uh, at the output, okay? And the, the difference is this five moles that were formed during the combustion reaction, okay? Each, we have 10 atoms of H, each one, uh, each pair of uh, H, okay? So two, uh, two multiplied by f five gives 10, okay? And this, just to show you that this is water that was formed during the process, okay? So we now can go back to the overall a scheme of the process and write down the results that we already have, okay? We already have, we already had the results corresponding to the fuel, okay? 90 tons of fuel, 60 tons of water, and with the corresponding exergy contents, okay? Now, um, making the calculations for the amount of air, for instance, the amount of oxygen, this number here, 106.2 tons of O2, uh, the calculation I believe is here, uh, no, no, I didn't show you here, but uh, well, in this, uh, on the right hand side here, I, I leave some calculations that's to, to show you how I can do it. For instance, uh, let me go back one slide, this number 0 0.777 is uh, uh, in terms of kilograms of water per kilogram of fuel. Since we have 90 kilograms of fuel, okay, multiplied by 0 0.777 minus 60 because 
we ha already have 60 tons of water entering uh, with the fuel okay so it gives this difference 9.93 tons of water which is written down here okay so that's how we make the calculations uh, yeah, in the X, the corresponding XAG contents and so on. Okay, so that's the difference. We get, you see, we get, we have 60 tons of water entering the process, and we get 125.9 tons of water at the exit. So we have we have a lot of water actually, more than than twice as much as we have at the input here. Okay, so this is a very interesting aspect of the process. We also have uh, we have to inject 160, 106.2 tons of, of O2. I didn't show the calculation here, but uh, you do the same thing. You multiply, okay, 1.18 by, by, by 90, okay, by, by 90 tons per hour, you, ha you have this result, okay? So you're going to see, every time that we come back to this slide, is to, to write down the results that we have, okay? Okay, now, uh, I don't remember. Yeah, we're going to focus on the oxygen process, separation process, okay? And it's here. We already know how much oxygen we need for, for the combustion process, okay? What I need to do now is to assess the amount of exergy that uh, is going to be necessary for this separation, okay? So what we're going to do we are going to apply, in order to calculate this uh, exergy necessary for the separation process, okay, these, these slides are from the, from the separation process, the, uh, from the class in which I analyze, in terms of exergy, a separation process, okay? So uh, what we're going to do is to apply the exergy balance equation to this control volume, okay? to assess what we call the minimal separation work, okay, which we can multiply by, a, a divide actually by a, a practical efficiency to assess the actual separation work, okay. But in order to calculate the minimum separation work, we apply this uh, exergy balance equation, okay. In our case, uh, this is, um, uh, this is zero, okay, because it's adiabatic, okay. There's no change in, in the overall pressures. Uh, and if we want to, let me see the next slide. Yeah, the next slide is easier to explain in the next slide. So we want to calculate this in a permanent regime, okay. There is no expansion of the frontiers here, so this term is zero, okay. The, the control volume is not varying, it's geometry. The process is adiabatic, so we don't have the here, okay? And uh, if we want to, to calculate the smallest amount of work, what I need to do is zero exergy destruction, okay? So by zeroing this term here, okay, this one will correspond to the minimum separation work. That's the, the most the maximum efficiency of the process, okay? And this is due to the second law of thermodynamics. So, just to repeat, to be clear, okay, if we zero, if we cancel, if we impose this term to be zero, this term here is what we call the minimum separation work, okay? So, the, the resulting working formula is this one. The minimum separation work is the difference in, in, in exergy, okay, what's entering associated with all mass flows and what's exiting, okay. So we're going to do this calculation. Uh, before that, just to, uh, to specify a result, we're going to neglect chemical exergy, kinetic exergy, and potential, potential exergy, okay, these terms are neglected. And uh, here you have the, the definition of exergy, okay, as I showed you. And uh, another term that's going to cancel out is this term here, H. It's not that, that this term is zero, okay, this term is not zero, 
but since the process uh, supposedly the, uh, occurring with ideal gases and at constant temperature okay pressure and temperature are constant uh, for you know for an ideal gas the enthalpy depends only on temperature it does not depend on pressure okay and if the temperature is constant okay the temperature of a here okay 25 degrees is equal to the temperature here 25 degrees so that the, the entropies are equal okay are the same okay so they will cancel out each other it's not that they are zero okay they will cancel out so we only have this term here the difference in terms of entropy okay let me move on okay so ap applying this result this is our working formula okay and uh, well this is um, or theoretical air atmospheric air okay we're going to neglect uh, components other than oxygen and nitrogen okay why O2 and why N2 are the corresponding concentrations okay we know okay air atmospheric air contains roughly 21 percent of of oxygen and 79 percent of nitrogen okay the remaining components uh, we are neglecting because they are not significant in terms of energy uh, calculations okay for for this type type of analysis that we're doing okay so applying here okay we have at the, the at the entrance okay mo2 is the mass flow rate of o2 times the exergy content of o2 okay plus the mass flow rate of nitrogen times the exergy the specific exergy of n2 at the entrance okay and minus uh, mass flow rate of o2 times the exergy content of o2 at exit number one so here okay and the same thing for exit number two which is the exit uh, from where we get nitrogen okay by by since the mass flow rates are the same okay mass flow rates are the same we can um, isolate them like this this is ma mass flow rate of oxygen times the difference now it's easier to to identify this term that, that's the difference in of the exergy content at the input compared to the output okay and the same for nitrogen and since I'm going back okay one slide since the the enthalpy terms cancel out exactly here okay if you put the the definition of enthalpy in here the enthalpies of this term and this one is the same so they cancel out and you get only uh, the entropies okay and well, let me see the next slide yeah and well this is already very interesting because you see the work that you're going to expand to, to spend is being spent actually to decrease the, the to decrease the entropies of the compounds of oxygen and nitrogen so it's very coherent this result okay, okay uh, just to get uh, a specific work we divide by the mass flow rate the total mass flow rate of air this is not argon okay it's portuguese sorry for the portuguese this is air okay dividing by the mass flow rate of air we have specific work and this uh, mass flow rate of o2 divided by the total mass flow rate we have concentration so so this is concentration okay and as i said this result is very very eloquent actually because you see the work is being spent to decrease the entropies okay to increase the organization level of the system okay yeah uh, now what we need to do is to calculate the entropy change of the process okay the entropy change of the process uh, just an observation before moving on in this case of the oxygen separation process i didn't i didn't want to jump the the specifics okay as i did for the combustion process so i'm showing you all the details all the calculations uh, because i don't recall I, I think i didn't show you that's the first time i show you this okay so uh, let's see 
how we can calculate the entropy change of the process because you know the entropy since it's not mixed okay the uh, an unmixed uh, flow of oxygen has a lower entropy compared with a mixed flow of oxygen so it, you're reducing entropy since you're reducing entropy you're going to need to expand work okay that's how physically the, the process is happening but we, ne we need to assess we need to calculate this so let's do it oh yeah and so we are going to need this result so we're going we're going to name this result we're going to name it bovarine okay because well you'll see <laughs> okay so let's try to calculate the entropy change we start by calculating the the what we call the isothermal compression work why why is this because the process actually corresponds to compressing you have oxygen molecules for instance at the entrance here which are represented here okay they are the the, the whole mixture is at one bar but oxygen is at its uh, partial pressure actually 21 percent of one bar okay 0.21 bar at the exit it's at uh, the pressure is one bar so what you're doing you're compressing from 0.21 bar okay that's the partial pressure of oxygen at the entrance you're compressing this to one bar at the exit here okay so you need, you're going to need work you're going to need a force that is compressing these molecules here okay and it's isothermal because temperature is not varying okay so this is easy to be done uh, you start by well work is always uh, pdv integral of pdv from one to two one and two are the, the this one and two is not uh, this one and this two that's the initial state and final state okay since uh, we are dealing with perfect gases we can use the perfect gas law okay so we replace here and we get since n r and t the number of moles are in the temperature they are constant okay we get only integral of dv divided by v okay and this uh, brings about this term ln of v2 divided by v1 2 and 1 repeating is the final and initial state okay you can uh, use the perfect law perfect gas law to to express this express this in terms of pressure okay so it's p1 divided by p2 and now i'm going to write this down because i think it's easier okay p1 is pressure of oxygen at the initial state so it's um, the partial pressure of oxygen po2 okay divided by p2 p2 is total pressure one bar divided by p okay and you know p equals p oxygen plus uh, partial pressure of nitrogen okay so in this you know is the molar concentration of o2 okay you know that from from uh, perfect gas law okay so that's why we have finally this result here okay we have this result for the isothermal compression work okay and this result we're going to name it because we're going to need it in a few moments this is our rambo result okay rambo results uh, now the next step we apply first law of thermodynamics to this process here okay that's the initial state and that's the final state okay so q minus w equals delta u q is heat w is uh, work okay it's this work here and delta u is the variation of the internal energy since the temperature is constant okay this term is zero okay this term is zero so we have that uh, q equals w okay and here that's the the left hand side here is the definition of uh, entropy variation is q divided by t okay and since q we know it it's equal to w we replace and we have this final result that delta s equals to w divided by t and 
and we are going to replace Rambo in this place here. We know how to calculate W, okay? So we get this final result here, okay? Delta S equals NR times LN, uh, natural logarithm of the molar concentration, okay? Uh, this is for one compound. If we have a mixture of compounds, we, you just add these components like this, okay? Uh, and if you divide this equation by the total mass flow rate, now, now this, it's not mass flow rate, it's molar flow rate. We need to use molar concentration because of this, this uh, equation here, okay? So here, if you divide everything by the total molar flow rate, you have specific entropy variation in terms of molar concentrations, okay? This final result is very, very important, and we're going to name this Chuck Norris result, okay? Now we're going to uh, combine these results, okay? Chuck Norris is going to fight against Wolverine, okay? So we replace Chuck Norris result into Wolverine result, and we get this final result here, okay? And um, yeah, if that's for for two components, but you if you have more components, ten or twelve, you simply you make this summation here, okay? And uh, we can do the calculations for for our case, okay? So we are applying that formula, okay, to our case, and those are the numbers, okay? I'm just leaving the numbers here if you want to to uh, do these calculations by yourself, it's already uh, easy for you, okay? So, but this is the gas constant, okay? T0, everything's happening at 25 degrees, so 25 plus 273.15 is, is in Kelvin, okay? Times the concentrations. 0 0.21 is the concentration of oxygen, okay? So 0 0.21 and 0 0.79 is the concentration of nitrogen. When you do this, you get this number, minus 1.274 kilojoules per mole. This is kilojoules per mole of uh, mixture, okay? And uh, multiplying by the molar mass of air, okay? Atmospheric air, you get this result in terms of kilograms. So minus 44 kilojoules per kilogram of air. And minus, this means that we have to actually import work. Okay, this is a convention. Now, remember, when a work is positive, when it's being exported from the, from the control volume. Okay, so negative means that it, you have actually to import work. Okay, so this result, this is a very, very important result. This is the minimum theoretical work necessary for this complete separation and we're going to use this this result it's so important that we're going to name it the terminator result okay that's the terminator result and we are going to use this result terminator here right here okay so uh, uh, yeah that's the the mass flow rate calculation of mass flow rate i, I showed you already okay so that's the uh, uh, that's the, the amount of air that has to be processed, 455 tons per hour. If we multiply this by, uh, by the terminator, we get this amount of exergy necessary for the separation, okay? 44.097, going back one slide, is actually this result here, okay? So, uh, 44.097 times 455 tons per hour and converting this to kilograms per second to get the result the final result in terms of megawatts okay so this is this is, is the amount of exergy that I have to to draw from the the exergy bus okay uh, we also have we can also calculate since we are separating nitrogen okay and the concentration of nitrogen here is 100%, this is 100% nitrogen, and it's different from the concentration of nitrogen 
at the in the atmosphere so it also have uh, some amount of chemical exergy that we can assess here. Uh, I left the calculations in here for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, we can move on now. Right? Now we're going to pass to the heat transfer at the boiler tubes. Okay, we're going to analyze here. Okay, now I can move a little bit faster now because things are easier now. Okay, so we're going to assess everything here we're going to analyze here so that's our control volume we know already the amount of gases that we have okay 265.5 tons per hour of hot gases okay the composition is here okay and this is easy to to be done since everything is uh, very much like a perfect gas you can simply define uh, your this mixture okay I can show you in in ref prop, okay? You can, for instance, uh, let me show you how. Define your your mixture. Define a new mixture, okay? Define a new mixture. So you choose the components. We have carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, add, and water, okay? Water, add, okay? Then it's going to ask the the molar concentrations uh, or um, uh, molar fractions yeah you, you can work in terms of moles or in terms of uh, 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 mass concentrations okay mass fraction or, or molar fraction so in our case car carbon dioxide I'm not uh, sure it's uh, 4851 okay or let's just to be easy 49 and 51 percent okay so you have now uh, pseudo 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 uh, pure fluid okay so you can calculate everything you give a temperature 700 degrees pressure one bar and you have the corresponding enthalpies okay you don't have to calculate individually enthalpy of, of uh, carbon dioxide enthalpy of water and then add this these enthalpies you you can have you can define a pseudo pure fluid and make all the calculations much simpler okay so that's what i did here i defined this uh, pseudo pure fluid and these numbers 48.8 51.2 comes from the combustion analysis okay so here is just a graph to show you different temperatures and one bar and all the results that you need okay enthalpy uh, cp if you want to calculate in terms of temperature and so on okay so we have this entering at 750 okay uh, it's going out at 170 degrees okay so the, the amount of heat that I have to remove that's what I'm going to calculate now okay so uh, the the temperature diagrams for for the gases is this red curve here so it, we are removing heat from the gas from the, the, the combustion gases so its temperature is dropping down to 170 degrees okay uh, the working fluid of the Rankine cycle okay we are we are fixing its lower temperature at 100 degrees okay this could be at this could be 25 degrees but remember since we need heat for the process for heating water for instance we are fixing this at 100 degrees okay so this temperature is already known okay and another parameter that we're fixing is the working pressure okay so uh, the combustion gases are releasing heat and this heat is absorbed by water of the Rankine cycle so you have liquid water here it heats to the um, uh, boiling temperature okay then it transforms to to vapor and then it, you have a superheated steam here at the end okay so the equations are very simple energy balances the amount of heat uh, q equals n delta h it's always these equations q equals n delta h and we're going to apply this for the gases and also for the working fluid of the Rankine cycle okay so for the the combustion gases we already have these numbers okay so that's the the mass flow rate 265.5 tons per hour okay that's the enthalpy at 
750 degrees so you have it here 750 degrees one bar okay minus the amplitude fg stands for flue gases okay here so that's the enthalpy of those gases at 170 degrees so you have it here okay so you have the enthalpies the numbers are here and when we get this final result that corresponds so you need to remove 69.89 megawatts of heat in order to cool down from 750 to 170 okay so that's the amount of heat that you have to remove or that the combustion ha gases have to release to to the working fluid of the ranking side okay now what we're going to do we're going to analyze the the, the cold fluid actually okay uh, but uh, what we're going to do because we can we can design a, a boiler uh, to work like this you know the higher this temperature the higher this temperature this final temperature the the higher will be the this the thermodynamic cycle efficiency first law efficiency okay so we can use uh, very huge areas of, of heat exchanges so that this temperature is going to be equal to 750 degrees okay we you in other words you get this temperature to be equal to this one by using very very huge areas this can be shown i'm not going to show you but from this last equation okay if you if a which is the area of these heat exchangers if it, if, the, if the area goes to infinity okay you can show that this temperature goes to tends to 750 and this is interesting as i mentioned because the efficiency of the thermodynamic cycle will be maximum okay will be maximized so that's what we're going to do okay so the final temperature of water we're using water the final temperature is 750 degrees pressure 150 bar the initial temperature is 100 degrees same pressure you have uh, the corresponding enthalpies and we uh, we know the amount of heat that water needs to absorb okay in order to cool down these uh, combustion gases so this is 69.89 megawatts uh, you have the enthalpies the final enthalpy the initial enthalpy and you get the amount of water flow rate here so, okay making all the calculations 19.777 kilograms per second okay so that's the result that we have and and that that is the exact flow rate set or, or produced by this pump here okay remember we are using uh, this flow rate in order to control the temperature at 750 degrees oh sorry at uh, 170 degrees okay if you have for instance fuel with a little higher uh, heat content okay uh, things will, all the calculations will change and you will see that uh, this flow rate will increase a little bit okay so the result that we have the mass flow rate 265 okay 750 170 and now we have the water flow rate 19.78 or 777 kilograms per second uh, from 150 bar 100 degrees to 150 bar to 750 degrees okay so we have this result and we can uh, write this result uh, compile this result in our diagram here so the amount of heat removed from the combustion gases we ca just calculated 69.89 megawatts a temperature here 750 degrees 100 degrees and we now have the flow rate here okay now what we need to do we need to uh, calculate the amount of work that this process can produce and the amount of heat that's going to be rejected here okay so that's what we're going to do we're, we're going to analyze the steam power cycle okay the corresponding control volume now is here okay and well that's very easily done as i mentioned it's a rankini without uh, any kind of uh, uh, more elaborate scheme in order to to have higher efficiency so it's a simple rankini cycle okay uh, 
we already know the amount of heat supplied to this cycle 69.89 megawatts we know the temperatures 170 750 degrees okay and well we have to calculate the rest so uh, you see here for instance uh, the the higher energy point here 750 degrees 150 bar that's the enthalpy uh, then you you cool this down to to 100 degrees okay that's the expansion through the turbine okay to, to 100 degrees that's here okay uh, so 100 degrees the same entropy you see this is point 0.1 okay i'm showing you i'm showing you one by one because these numbers one two three four does not correspond to these numbers here okay so this this label for actually yeah it, it is <laughs> It's the country, okay? It's exactly the same. Uh, I, I thought I didn't, uh, I didn't make this, okay? So uh, that's the same entropy. That's the isentropic expansion through the turbine. So you have same entropy, and that's the temperature variation, okay? And the same here from 1 to 2, okay? So you have 100 degrees. Uh, 1.0142 bar then that's the corresponding entropy and then uh, the next pressure 150 bar and the same entropy here okay so with this you have all enthalpies and then what you can do you calculate uh, all heats and uh, works involved in this process so one two just going back one slide is the amount of exergy absorbed by the pump okay in order to pump liquid water from uh, 100 degrees roughly one bar to 150 bar so that's the amount of uh, exergy it's always flow rate times delta h okay so that's the flow rate in kilograms per second that's delta h okay and you have uh, this amount of exergy minus um, implies that you need to import work okay uh, now the amount of heat absorbed okay you, we already know this comes from the combustion gases 69.83 okay so just to to verify this result that's the flow rate that's delta h it's exactly the same result okay w34 i'm going back one slide is the amount of exergy produced by the turbine okay so it's flow rate times delta h so flow rate times the corresponding delta h here okay from from uh, this one to this one okay 27.51 megawatts and the amount of heat rejected okay flow rate times delta h minus 42.63 megawatts uh, this is exergy okay this is exergy uh, pure exergy and uh, yeah this pure exergy but key uh, q23 and q41 that's heat so we have to assess the amount of exergy or the exergy content of these heat fluxes okay we can do it like this okay uh, so just showing you the exergy content of the rejected heat the calculations necessary for for this going back one slide so we know that the amount of heat is 42.63 so 42.63 times the carnot efficiency uh, of a cycle working between the temperatures 25 which is the ambient the, the environmental temperature and 100 degrees okay because it's rejecting heat here at 100 degrees the re result is 8.56 megawatts okay so the result here we have 27 uh 27.2 okay being injected in the exergy bus okay we have 42.63 megawatts of heat injected in the heat bus and this uh heat convey conveys 8.57 megawatts of exergy okay that's uh, we're going to new we're going to need to use this result here for the overall exergy balance okay uh, what we have more yeah we have 
we can calculate the efficiency, 38.9%. And yeah, that's it. That's the result that we get. Okay. I'm going to accelerate a little bit because I have, um, I'm, I'm a little bit late. Okay. So the, the next process is the dewatering de -watering process. Okay. This one, we have uh, hot gases here, carbon dioxide and uh, water, water vapor. Okay. And what we're going to do, we're going to condense, we're going to cool this mixture down and so that the water condenses. Okay, so that's it. We're going to remove heat from this process somehow. Okay, and the temperature is going to drop from 107 degrees to 25 degrees. Okay, uh, by doing this, water condenses. So you have here water. At 25 degrees and now you have liquid water here okay that's a very simple process the only uh, the only aspect important aspect here is that the mixture at the input it is at one bar okay one bar and one bar is equal actually to the this one bar okay is equal to uh, the partial pressure of CO2 plus partial pressure of water vapor okay since we are going to condense this uh, water vapor it's, it's being condensed here the only remaining pressure at this point will be the partial pressure of CO2 okay so yeah that's it it's going to I'm going to show you the specifics in a, in a few moments. So uh, by doing these calculations, let's calculate everything. So these uh, mass concentrations actually correspond to this molar concentration. Okay. So 51, 51.49, 51%, 49% 51 in terms of mass correspond to 72.23 or yeah, 72.28 in terms of molar concentration. So those are the corresponding partial pressures, okay? So what we're going to have here, uh, yeah, what we need to do now is to calculate the enthalpies at the corresponding pressures, okay? So this is for CO2. That's the input. I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to zoom this for you to see it better, okay? So this is CO2 at the input, 170 degrees. That it's the partial pressure of CO2, 0. 27 bar okay and that's the corresponding enthalpy and that's the final temperature okay 25 and the pressure remains the same okay so that's the enthalpy variation and the same for water okay that's water at the inputs 170 degrees that's 0 0.72 is the partial pressure of water vapor at the input okay so that's the corresponding enthalpy. And that's the, the tricky part, okay? That's the temperature of water at the output, temperature of water here, okay, at this point here, 25 degrees. But, okay, the, the pressure, okay, that, that this liquid water experiences is actually being exerted by carbon dioxide. So this pressure here corresponds to the partial pressure or the, the pressure of CO2. Okay, so that's why we are calculating at this pressure. Okay, okay. So we have all enthalpies, and we can do the this calculation. Okay, the amount of heat it's the amount of heat necessary to to make this transformation for water and for this transformation for CO2. We can do this calculation. We have everything we need. Okay, so. The amount of heat to be removed from CO2, it's, it's flow rate times delta H. The numbers are here. So we need to remove 4.767 kilowatts from CO2. And we need to remove 102.48 kilowatts uh, from water. This, this number is very um, um, much greater than this one because you have uh, latent heat involved. You, you have to condense water. Okay, so that's why this number is so uh, big. Adding these two numbers, you get 
25 kilowatts. That's the amount of heat that we need to remove in order to dewater the, the gas. Okay. And the corresponding exergy content, I can simply multiply uh, by what would be an average efficiency of a Rankine cycle. Okay. Uh, by average, th the problem here is that the temperature is not constant. Okay. It varies between 170 and 25 degrees. Okay. But since the amount is anyway it's small, we can uh, assume that this process occurs at a constant temperature equal to the average temperature between 170 and 25. Okay. This actually, you know, it, it's an approximation. Okay. Uh, but it gives a good result in this case. I'm going to show you for CO2 compression. I'm going to calculate um, by, by making the same assumption. And then I'm going to calculate by the exact definition of, of uh, exergy. Okay? By integrating this, this, this formula here. Not using this, uh, this approximation. Okay, this is so. In other words, this is an approximated result, which is good for this case, but it's not going to be good for the CO2 compression case. Okay, uh, but well, we're going to elaborate a little bit further, uh, just to show you how to to do it. Okay, so uh, compiling the results now, we have the amount of heat being removed here and the corresponding exergy content. Okay approximated exergy content. Uh, what we need to do now is to uh, analyze the compression uh, compression cycle, okay, CO2 compression to supercritical CO2. Uh, yeah, so that's the corresponding control volume. Okay, that's the corresponding control volume. And you can see that I have one of those symbols that allow me to, to jump a few slides. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to jump, I'm, I'm simply going to pass through these slides just to show you what I, was, uh, what I would be talking about. Actually, the following slides explain what is supercritical CO2. Okay? Uh, supercritical CO2 actually corresponds to, to, uh, to pressures and temperatures above the, the critical pressure and critical temperature. And this actually is a pressure and temperature above this point here in the um, equilibrium diagram. Okay, So for instance, uh, for, for CO2, this point, the critical point, corresponds to roughly uh, 31 degrees, 74 bar. Okay, So it's a mild, relatively mild condition. So if you are above let me write this down, okay? So if you are above this, let me change the color, okay? If you are above this temperature and above this pressure, anywhere above here, okay, you get supercritical CO2. And supercritical CO2, you can see on the, on the right here, okay? This actually is a, a small video. I, I can show you. Uh, you have... You have, for instance, yeah, I can show you the video. Actually, it's more interesting. You start with a mixture of uh, vapor and liquid at this point one here, okay? Then you heat and increase temperature at constant volume, okay? So what's going to happen? I'm going to release the movie. What's going to happen is that the liquid phase becomes soluble, and the, the corresponding density of the liquid phase becomes equal to the density of the gas phase. So what they are mixing, the gas phase is mixing, you see here very clearly, into the liquid phase and vice versa. Okay. And finally, what you get is a kind of a, if you could, I'm going to jump to the end. If you could uh, get this, this supercritical CO2, if you, could, if you could put it in your hand, uh, you would feel something like a mayonnaise, okay? Because it's a uh, emulsion, actually. Uh, small droplets of liquid CO2 mixed with uh, gas, okay? And uh, well, that's very interesting in terms of uh, carbon capture because 
The density, I think it's the next slide. Uh, if you calculate the densities and viscosities of, of CO2, you get this result, interesting result. Okay? The density, they, they become equal okay, above the critical temperature, but it's, um, it tends to, to the density of the liquid. Okay, so it's, it's, it's uh, dense. Okay, you have um, small volumes. Um, the same, uh, one kilogram of CO2 occupies a smaller volume. Okay, the other important aspect is the viscosity. Okay, and the viscosity, they also tend to be the same, but it tends to the viscosity of the vapor, which is very low. So it's very interesting because if you want to inject uh, CO, supercritical CO2 into a porous rock, for instance, the, the, the power necessary for this is going to be small because the viscosity is low. Okay? And you're still injecting a lot of kilograms because the density is high. So that's, that's uh, why supercritical CO2 is very adequate for carbon capture, for geological carbon starch. Okay, that's that's it. Uh, yeah, so uh, I should be here now. <laughs> should have jumped to this point to analyze the process. As I mentioned, okay, this we're going to use a very simple compression process. We could be using more stages here with more intercoolers in order to to use less exergy here, but. The idea is that if I can show that the overall exergy balance is still positive, okay, even though the, the Rankine cycle is not uh, very elaborate, uh, and also the compression uh, system is very simple. So if, if it's still positive, that, that means a very interesting result. Okay? So that's the simpler that we can do, okay? uh, two stages. Let's see how things are done. Okay, you start with CO2 at 25 degrees, 0 0.23 bar. Okay, you compress to uh, a certain pressure. Okay, we're going to calculate this in a while. Okay, you cannot, let me just uh, say something. You cannot compress this directly to 80 bar because the temperature would be too high. Okay, so that's one one reason why you cannot compress this to directly to 80 bar okay but also uh, if you know you know that uh, uh, the smallest amount of work correspond to a isothermal compression okay so the ideal in terms of energy consumption would be to make a isothermal compression but we cannot do this okay so we do it in steps, as I show you. So you compress to uh, an intermediary pressure, then you cool down this to 25 degrees, then you compress to 80 bar, okay? And then you cool down again to 25 degrees, okay? The point here is to, how can I calculate this intermediary pressure in order to minimize the total compression work, okay? So it's a problem of optimization. Uh, if you go to these uh, thermodynamic books, there are some theoretical formulas uh, that give you um, this pressure here. But these formulas assume that the gas is perfect. And that's uh, very far away from being true for CO2. Okay, so it's better to... To, to make some manual calculations, let's say, like this, okay? Okay, so um, let's see how can we determine this pressure in order to, to have minimum power consumption here. So let's do it by trial and error, as I'm showing you. Let me zoom here. So this is a simulation. The, the spreadsheet, I can uh, post the link for you to download it. So let's see how it's done. I first start, I'm going back, sorry, one slide. We're going to do by trial and error. Okay, we're going to compress from initial pressure to one bar, then to 1.5 and so on. Okay, so we're going to calculate 
total compression work for many pressures, intermediary pressures, and we're going to choose the, the least one. Okay, so that's exactly what's being done here. So you start at one bar. I'm going to zoom here because... Okay, so we start at one bar, increase to 1.25 and so on, going, going all the way to 10 bar, okay? And then we do all the intermediary calculations. So we have, okay, for each intermediary pressure, we have uh, pressures and temperatures, you see enthalpies here in yellow, okay? So uh, with these enthalpies, we can calculate work and heat, okay? And we can add here. This is the total uh, absorbed work, okay? And if we plot, now here, you see the, the intermediary pressure, let me zoom here, okay? We can plot intermediary pressure and uh, total work, and we see clearly that we have a minimum here, okay? Which corresponds to this yellow line here. So 4.75 correspond to the intermediary pressure of minimal work consumption. Okay, so that's why how we can uh, set this pressure. Okay, I'm not uh, spending too much time in this spreadsheet because, well, you can download it from from our site, from from our Facebook page. Okay, if you are interested in this type of calculation, and uh, repeating, you have theoretical formulas to to calculate this pressure, but they assume that uh, you have perfect gas, and that's not the case for CO2. Okay. So that's why I'm, I'm using a trial and error method, okay? Okay, so let me move on. Now we have this intermediary pressure, 4.75, okay? Now we have everything we need to calculate. So we calculate enthalpies, they are here, okay? So H1 is enthalpy at 25 degrees, 0 0.23 bar, okay? That's H1. H2 is... Um, is the, this state here is defined by the pressure, 4.75, and by its entropy, because the entropy of state 2 is equal to the entropy of state 1, the, the, the same entropy here. So, by, by stating that pressure is this one and the entropy is this one, I get this temperature, okay, 273 degrees, and this entropy. We need enthalpies to calculate heats and works, okay? So we have H2, H3, we have pressure, okay, 4.75, and we have temperature. So we have, it's like GPS coordinates. We, we always need two coordinates to define a state, a thermodynamic state, okay? So H3, same thing for H4, and same thing for H5, okay? So we have all enthalpies, and we can calculate all works and um, and heats, so they are calculated here. Okay, so we now have, uh, yeah, we now have these results, and now that's the time that I'm going to to calculate exergies using two different methods, two different approaches. Okay, the approximated one and the exact one to show you the difference. Okay, so this number here we already have you. We we have this uh, we have this when we add this to this we have the total work okay total work here we need only to multiply by 129.6 tons per hour in order to have an absolute value here which we can do we get 16 megawatts okay that's the absorbed heat okay the calculations are done here okay so uh, the the work absorbed by the first stage is the flow rate converted to kilograms per second times 235.87 I'm going back two slides okay it's this one this specific work here okay that's the work uh, consumed absorbed by this process here okay 235 so it's here 235.87 or 8.49 megawatts Okay, 
the amount of heat is here okay so that's mass flow rate times delta h so 8.6 megawatts uh, that's the work absorbed by the second stage mass flow rate times a specific work 7.6 megawatts and the heat associated with the last process so mass flow rate times delta h 16.21 megawatts okay so now we have the total work so it's 8.49 plus 7.6 megawatts that's this result here okay and well this result we're going to name it Batman result because it's a very important one we're, we're going to reference this result in a while what we need to do now is to assess the exergy content associated with this heat flows here in here okay and I'm going to do using two different approaches okay the first one uses the, the average temperature approach okay so the average temperature between 25 and the corresponding temperature here which is 273 degrees it's here okay so 273 plus 25 divided by 2 is the average temperature okay and we multiply this by 8.64 which is the heat removed at the intercooler okay we get this result 3.928 megawatts okay the same thing for the second uh, heat removal process we get 7.21 so, as I mentioned this is an approximated approach I'm going to which is fine for the for the for the preceding um, exergy contents of the for instance of the dewatering process but I'm going to show it's not fine for this case here so we're going to to allow ourselves to work a little bit harder in order to calculate this by the exact definition of exergy okay and we're going to compare these results okay so let's do it now okay so the exergy the definition or, or for uh, for a process that that have a temperature that has a temperature that is varying okay you can calculate from this expression okay so de of the process so this is a differential variation in the exergy content okay so you multiply by the corresponding uh, by, by the, the the individual or the local uh, kernel efficiency okay you multiply by this by d uh, del q okay so the problem here is that the temperature is varying it's not constant okay well we can uh, we can uh, express this amount of heat exchange okay since pressure is constant because from from uh, two to three the process the temp the sorry the pressure is constant so we can evaluate this from cp times dt okay and cp varies with t with temperature okay so no problem we have a uh, how to assess this so we we simply integrate this in order to calculate the the the, the finite exergy variation okay specific variation okay so this cp this is cp in terms of the temperature okay and when we replace and integrate everything we can do this numerically there's no problem we get 70 uh, 67 kilojoules per kilogram when i multiply this number by mass flow rate okay i get this final result 2.4 megawatts okay so we can compare this to it's not that bad actually okay 3.93 compared to 2.41 that's that's the the one that we obtained by uh, by assuming that uh, um, this integral can be replaced by the corresponding average temperature integral okay and why I just I want to ask you a question why this is uh, not that bad I'm going back a few slides to show you the uh, temperature entropy diagram the here the process is not that bad because 
we are evaluating the exergy content of this transformation here, okay? And you see the pressure is very low, so you're very, you're far away from the uh, supercritical states. Okay, the corresponding critical pressure is 73.7 bar. So since you're far away from this critical pressure, you don't have uh, so much problem. The problem, as you will see, will happen here because actually we at 4 we are supercritical co2 is supercritical and at 5 we are sub our co2 is subcritical actually it's compressed liquid and here cp everything is varying a lot so the approximation will not uh, work properly okay so let me show you this uh, this time okay so the first one is okay because we are, or CO2 is not uh, close to the critical states, okay? So let, let's apply now the same method, the same exact method for the second uh, uh, transformation, okay? From 4 to 5, okay? So the same, DE45, the same, the same formula. The only thing is that I need to replace this CP from, from here, okay? And you see, it's much more complex. I'm going back one slide, okay? Uh, here, a linear curve represents uh, very well CP, okay? And now, since CP is varying a lot, I need a, a much more complex curve, okay? Because I have supercritical states and also subcritical states here. So I need a more complex curve. Okay, because you see it's varying from, let me zoom this, okay, oops, sorry, let me get this here, so uh, CP is, is varying a lot from 1.13 to 3.55, okay, and it's, uh, uh, it's uh, very, very different from a linear curve, okay, so I need a much more complex curve. But anyway, no problem, I can replace this and make all integrals numerically. I get this result and the final result, that's the specific exergy content multiplying by the mass flow rate, I get 3.03 megawatts. And now I have a, a bigger difference, okay? Instead of 7.22, I have 3. Point, uh, roughly 50% difference, so it's, it's uh, much more... Uh, the difference is much more significant because we have all these variations, okay? So if you want to do exact calculations, you have to do this, okay? You have to do this. Uh, you can uh, adopt a, an approximated approach for the processes that are not uh, close to the critical states, okay? I just wanted to show this because it's important. So we have all results. We have the, the total power Okay, we have the exergy contents. We can uh, put this down yeah, here, write this down. So uh, that's the, the power that needs to be sent to the compressors. So that's Batman. Okay. The two most important ones are the terminator and Batman because you need this power to separate oxygen and you also need this power to compress CO2. Okay. And we also have the corresponding exergy contents here, okay, 2.41 and 3.03. .03. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention, I think I skipped this. Okay, yeah, the exergy content of uh, supercritical CO2. That's simple, you just multiply mass, the corresponding mass flow rate to, to uh, the specific exergy content. Okay, I think I have this result here. Okay, 25 degrees, 80 bar. Yeah, I didn't ask for the, the exergy, but you can do it yourselves. Okay, you get this result, and that's the exergy content. Okay, corresponding to, to the CO2 output here. Okay, yeah, I see that uh, 7.759, I rounded to 7.76. Okay, now we have everything. Just uh, we we had a long way. We calculated everything. Now we can uh, 
um, analyze all results together. Okay, so let's do it. The first important result is the overall XRG balance. Okay, it's still positive. This number here, 5.52, is actually here, it's calculated here, is 27.2, which is the XRG injected by the turbine. Okay, minus the XRG. Uh, consumed by the separation process, 5.58, and the exergy consumed in the compression process here, okay, 16.09, okay. It's still positive, that means that we can still uh, sell electricity to the grid and make money out of it, okay. So that's very interesting because, you know, we used a very, very uh, non-elaborate cycle. We can have, we can do a lot better than this. So this number can be much higher. Okay, at least uh, at least something around 40 megawatts here, for instance. Okay, and also the compression process is very simple. We could be used. We could had used. Uh, we could have used the four four stages, for instance, and this number reduces a lot. Okay, uh, but even though we still have a positive result here. Okay, uh, another important result is that uh, we compare this to if we don't if we don't uh, produce supercritical CO2, we we do not make uh, um, oxy fuel combustion and so on. The amount of of exergy that we could be selling to the grid is 25.7 actually it's 25.2 megawatts is this power here okay uh, well but no water is recovered you know um, it's a lot better to have 27 megawatts than, than only five okay but the idea is that you can um, you can earn some uh, you can have some revenues by by selling carbon credits so from a, an economic point of view it's a matter of setting the price of, of carbon cr credits uh, to, a, to a level that uh, enables this from an economic, economic point of view but there's another advantage here as you see we have a lot of water being recovered here okay we have uh, 60 tons of water that's humidity of uh, of our fuel but we have more than twice here. And this is liquid water at 25 degrees. So our, our power plant actually becomes a water producer plant also. And so we don't need to, to import water in order to make this process to be viable. Okay. Another important result here that we need to, to finish is the overall extra G balance. Okay. So we now, we calculated all exergy contents okay so we have it here okay this number 5.52 is the exergy balance made in the exergy bus okay so that's what we can sell to the grid now we can analyze the process the overall process in terms of exergy so all inputs and outputs are represented only in terms of exergy okay so this is exergy sent to, to the compressors, okay, and so on. This is the exergy content of fuel. That's the the exergy for the separation process. The exergy content of uh, of these heats, heat flows here, and so on. Okay. So now what we do, we apply this formula here, okay, in order to to assess this term here, the amount of exergy that is being destroyed since this term here is zero because everything is permanent okay so we we add these numbers okay so just to explain the the calculations here 16.9 that's an input so it's plus okay 27.20 that's an output so it's minus and so on 8.57 okay 448 and 41.62 Okay, well, I just forgot for you, for you. And yeah, it's in megawatts, it's here. Okay, forgot. 
and so on. So the amount of exergy destroyed is 419 megawatts. That's very, very much. You see, the, the overall exergy efficiency is 5%. It's very, very low. So that we could be doing a, a lot better. Okay, we could be doing a lot better. We can also, if you, if you, uh, well, we, we can uh, have, we can calculate this in, in, in other terms. Well, but, uh, well, that's not important right now. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this point in a few moments. I just want to elaborate on this. Because you see, 95% uh, of the exergy input is being destroyed and as I mentioned we could be doing a lot better so what can we do now okay we already have a good result we have a positive exergy balance on the exergy bus okay but we already we know also that this is very bad actually because we have a lot of exergy destruction so what can we do to uh, increase this overall efficiency here Okay, well, we, we can identify the sources of exergy destruction. Okay, if we identify this, we identify uh, design optimization points or places in our process which can be optimized in terms of, of exergy destruction. You know, in order to reduce the amount of exergy that is being dis destroy destroyed. Okay. Uh, and, you know, exergy destruction, where, where are those points? Those points are associated with entropy generation, which are associated with irreversibilities, okay? And irrever irreversibility is, uh, well, or, or actually several types of, of phenomena, okay, that generate entropy. For instance, friction. Okay, friction. So if you have friction, you have generation of heat, and the process is uh, not symmetric. So you have generation of entropy, and consequently you have exergy destruction. So you have actually you have several places where you have uh, exergy destruction. For instance, sorry for the Portuguese here. Okay, when you have chemical reaction and mixture or mixing. Okay. Chemical reaction and mixing. This is uh, this is terrible. This this destroys. This generates a lot of entropy. We're going to make some calculations in a while. Okay, and so this is a place where you have exergy destruction. Okay. Also, you have heat exchange at finite temperatures. Okay. This is also a, a place where you have exergy destruction. And well, uh, del finite delta T, as I'm showing you. Yeah, I'm naming. I'm. I, we have Hulk. Uh, uh, here we have He-Man, and so on. Because just to give you a, a relative idea, uh, well, you see, Hulk is the bigger one. So that's that's the place where uh, the most of the exergy destruction is happening here. We're going to calculate this in a in a moment. Okay. So the idea is. When you identify this process, you try to, to change uh, the design in order to reduce. So let's see two examples. Let's see Hulk and Spider-Man. Okay? Uh, here you have chemical reaction, and here you have heat exchange at finite, finite temperature difference. Okay? Let's see the two in detail. And the idea is that you by yourselves can, can do the same for the other processes here. Okay, so let's see the worst one, which is the chemical reaction. Okay, so here you have the calculations. That's the chemical reaction. Okay, and that's the chemical exergy contents of all the constituents, oxygen, carbon dioxide, liquid, and gas water. Okay, and when we apply the, the exergy balance equation, Okay, so this equation, I'm going back a few slides, this equation is exactly as this one, okay? We don't have heat, it's adiabat, we don't have work, so we, we only have these terms here, okay? These terms here, and that's the formula. So one mole, one mole of C4H10O4, okay? And, well, 
the, the, the number is in the first slide. So plus 4.5, that's the exergy content of oxygen that is here, okay? and 5.3 exergy content of water that's that is here okay and the same thing for the products at 750 degrees okay so when we do these calculations okay you get well you get this result here okay 1876 kilojoules per mole which correspond to a, an efficiency of 14 percent or or 70, roughly 75% of all exergy destruction is happening at the chemical reaction. Okay, so it's that's why I, I named it Hulk because it's the worst place for exergy destruction. Let's see Spider-Man now. Okay, uh, delta T, find a delta T. Okay, that, that's the the result that we had. Okay, and uh, well, the problem is that this temperature difference is is finite okay it's not uh, differential a differential temperature difference yeah I have this this list here uh, I want just to to highlight uh, uh, I should have put this uh, list in the first the first slide of this sequence the sources as I mentioned the sources of irreversibilities uh, is related to to this this type of phenomena okay so heat transfer at finite delta t as i mentioned internal friction non-resisted expansion we ha we have this one okay and let me show you where it is we have this no this is he-man non-resisted expansion okay uh yeah where's the list yeah non-resisted expansion mixing Spontaneous chemical reaction, that's the, the, the case. Well, electric current, that's not the case. In elastic deformation, that's the, in shock waves and transonic flows. We may have this in the turbine, okay, the steam turbine. The case here is finite delta T, and that's because this temperature is finite, okay. So what you can do in order to, well, let's first, let's assess, let's evaluate this this exergy destruction so we are always applying this formula okay since uh in in a control volume here okay so we only have let me explain something first the control volume corresponding to this formula is here actually okay so it is here is here so this amount of heat is internal okay so this is zero because this is internal to the control volume you only have mass flow rates inputs and outputs input and output here okay so we only have mass flow rates steam and gases and the the corresponding uh, specific values for for water is here okay subcooled uh, compressed water and superheated and for the gas mixture 48% 52% carbon di dioxide water vapor okay so you have the corresponding exergies which you will multiply by the corresponding mass flow rates the results calculations are here and the result the final result the final total destruction is uh, 4.45 the efficiency is good the exergy, exergetic efficiency is good, 89%, but you could be doing better. Uh, this is related to the fact that we are using a very simple Rankine cycle. You could be doing better, as I mentioned, by adopting uh, a Rankine cycle, for instance, with reheat. Okay, so what we do, we, we expand, in, instead of expanding in one single stage, we expand that in two stages. So, for instance, let's let me zoom this for you to follow. Okay, so we have superheated steam. We expand to an intermediary pressure. Okay, here in four. Then we reheat. Okay, so you get temperature, and then you expand in a second stage. Okay, by doing this, what happens? Let's see in the cycle. What happened in the cycle is that the temperature remains well the delta t the average delta t is reduced okay so 
it, you have two good results. Actually, the efficiency of the overall process increases, the first law efficiency increases, and also the, the exergetic efficiency increases because delta T between the steam and the gases uh, is reduced. Okay, so you have two, two good results. Uh, the problem is that the cost, you have a more complex system and the corresponding cost is going to increase. Uh, another thing that you could do in order to increase, which I think, I'm not, I, I'm not sure because I, I didn't make the calculations, would not result in, in prohibitive costs, is to use uh, a compressed uh, nitrogen cycle. You see, in our process, we are producing nitrogen. And instead of using water, going back one slide, instead of using water for the, the thermodynamic cycle to generate, to generate exergy, okay, you could be using nitrogen. Okay? And you could use nitrogen with, re, uh, with recovery, or heat recovery. So let's follow how the process goes. Okay? So you have compressed nitrogen here, here, okay? Uh, let's see, yeah, you have uh, high pressure, high temperature nitrogen here at 4, okay, you expand, expand, so the pressure now is low, and the, the remaining heat can be used to preheat the nitrogen that's entering the boiler, okay, so this is a heat recovery scheme, okay. And well, you see, uh, you have you have the, the final cool down here and the compressor. Okay, you, it's easier to look in the temperature entropy diagram. So let's start here at the compressor. You compress to the working pressure pressure, maybe 150 bar. So you start at 50 bar. Okay, the lower pressure is much higher than the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so you compress to from 50 to 150. You you heat okay to to the to 750 degrees at four, for instance. Okay, and the idea is that when you when when you expand at the turbine here, the temperature at five at state number five is still very high. So that's the idea. You can use the residual uh, heat content of the gases at the exit here at 5, you can use to preheat the gas that is that was uh, compressed. And by doing this, you, you decrease the amount of energy that you need to get from, from the fuel, okay? which is uh, used to heat from 3 to 4. Okay? So by doing this, the efficiency goes uh, easily uh, to higher values than, than 50%. And remember, for our ranking cycle, uh, if I'm not wrong, we had 37%. Okay. So uh, this is a very interesting possibility. My suggestion is that you, if you are interested in this subject, my my suggestion is that you you try this these ideas, make all the calculations with these uh, changes. For instance, instead of using Rankine cycle, you change to this uh, compressed nitrogen cycle. Uh, another point, important point: this lower pressure here, you can also optimize. Okay, the same way we did for the for the CO2 compressor here. Okay. That's not that's not uh, probably not the best lower pressure in terms of the overall efficiency. So you, you can also do apply some optimization process here in order to calculate the best uh, lower pressure. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm almost finished. Uh, the the whole point of this uh, presentation for you is to show that. From a technical point of view, it is possible to capture atmospheric CO2 okay, and to transform it to supercritical CO2, which is suitable for geological storage. 
Okay, and since by technically possible, I mean that the overall exergy balance is still positive, which means that all the energy necessary to do this is uh, contained in the biomass. Okay, so if if you think that biomass uh, uh, is produced from from sun, okay, sun energy. This uh, this power plant becomes a, what I call a sun-powered CCS machine, carbon capture and storage machine. Okay, so you can, uh, from a technical point of view, it is possible to do this. Okay, uh, it's it may be a quixotic idea as I'm showing you because it's technically possible, but uh, it's not possible in a, from an economic point of view. But well, we need to. to to create this, these alternatives. And now what people need to do is to, is to set a proper carbon price in order to make this viable from an economic point of view. Okay, but uh, you know, there's, no, there's not a uh, natural market for carbon. So it's uh, uh, something that, that needs to be agreed between uh, all nations. So that's very complicated to be done. And that's why I'm, I use this image. We are still, we are still in, in, in Don Quixote <laughs> world, okay? Uh, okay, so does anybody have a question regarding the presentation today? Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the evaluation, okay? I need to, to grade you guys, to give you a grade. And uh, as I mentioned in the, f the beginning of the class, I'm going to ask for a, for a text, okay, and that uh, authored individually, okay? So you need to write something about the subjects that were covered during the course, okay, during this, the classes. The idea is that uh, you write something related to your specific works, okay? And uh, well, if it's it's nice if you can apply some of the methods or some of the ideas that I showed you in this in this course, okay? Uh, so you you can write uh, if you if you need suggestions, okay? You can ask me. You can send me some messages uh, through through Facebook, for instance, through our page in Facebook. I can give you suggestions. I can uh, send you, for instance. Uh, uh, if you want to talk about a specific topic, but you don't have information, I can send you some papers or some reports or some some uh, uh, some material so that you can uh, read and then write some pages. Okay. So the idea. Let me write this down. Eh? Okay. So I need a text. Okay. I need a text. Text from you guys. And uh, for instance, you don't have to write. 1,000 pages, okay? So if, if you write four pages, that's okay. If you, if you write 100, that's not okay because I'm not going to have the time to read 100 pages, <laughs> okay? So if you write four or five or 10 pages, that's a very flexible number, okay? It cannot be zero, okay? <laughs> zero, that's not allowed, okay? So four or five pages or 10, that's okay. And again, if you need suggestions, you just ask me. If you need material, you just ask me. Okay. So the idea is that uh, you send me this uh, by the end of the month. Okay. So that I can read and, and uh, give you a, a grade. Okay. But it's a very flexible. You're going to choose the subject that you're going to talk about. Okay. Uh, the only uh, requirement is that it has to be related to some of the topics covered in our classes, which is almost everything actually. Because I talked, of, I talked about economics, I talked ab about uh, environmental changes, I talked about exergy, and so on. Okay. Okay. So, does anybody have a question? So, thank you very much. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.